Now, if you're into animals with outstanding coloration that will catch the eyes of your friends when they come and visit, this will definitely be a stick insect for you. Hello and welcome back to Bug Realms. On this channel we like to discuss all things creepy crawly. So if that's something that interests you, please consider subscribing to the channel. So this is our very first Phasmid Files on the new channel. So thank you again to everyone that's come over to the new Bug Realms channel. Now obviously the playlist for current Phasmid Files is on the old channel. You can find the link in the description below. It will take you to the old channel's playlist. Now I want to create a couple of Phasmid Files before I add a playlist in this description so that you can find the rest of them here. Yes, I could transfer videos over, but it's, it's awkward, okay? It's awkward, you're just gonna keep getting notifications coming up of videos you've already seen. It's gonna take the views and the algorithm away from the original Phasmid files, and I'm here to educate more than just build a profit. So that's why we're gonna wait a while before we have the playlist here. But anyway, today's video is about the Oreofetes peruana. Now I could have pronounced the genus incorrectly on this one, so we're just gonna to refer to them as the O. peruana for today's video. Now, the thing is, I like to try and show you the more boring looking one before I show you the interesting, if they've got sexual dimorphism, that is, where a male and female look completely different. But in this species, both females and males are so striking and so beautiful that I can't decide which is prettier. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna decide about which one to show you first? I know, I'm gonna go and flip a coin. Okay, got myself a 2P here. Heads for the girly first, tails for the boy first. And we have, Ooh. heads, just to show you. Oh, it's blaring, but you trust me, right? That is heads. <laughs> okay. Right. Girly first it is. Let's learn about this beautiful species, shall we? Come on, girl. That's it. Come on, because I need to hold the camera while I teach these people. You can get off me. That's it, good girl. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is a mature female Oporuana. Now the lighting isn't quite as spot on as I'd like to pop that coloration, but I will move it in a moment. It's just that she was being so gentle and so calm, sat on this fake flower right now, that I just wanted to capture a shot. Now I have made some mistakes in keeping this species. This is not a species that I have yet mastered, but is a species I am determined to. So we're gonna learn and hear about my mistakes today and what I did to alter them to have success in adult specimens. Oh, she's having a look around. Look at that antenna going. She's beautiful. Right, I had to cut there because she started moving away. Um, so, what is there to tell you about the mistakes I had? Well, in nymphs, I messed up a little bit with this species. Now nymphs of this species, I don't have any to show you, but they pretty much look like this gal, but smaller. They have those yellow sections between the body parts, and they're just dead cute, pretty much, just like this. Now yellow is one of those danger warning signs, and that's something we'll get onto in a moment. But where did I fail? Well, you see, I had them in an enclosure that they were doing fine in. It wasn't too overcrowded, but it could have been bigger. And it had one large ventilation strip, meaning that the humidity could hold quite well in there. But when I went on holiday, I actually misted, well, I over misted the enclosure because I was away for a few days. Now this was my downfall. For when I returned home, I had lost around half of my nymphs of this species. Now they do like it humid, but what I had done is allowed stale air to circulate in the enclosure, which I believe was the cause for the mortalities in this species. So balancing 
a humid environment by cutting the amount of ventilation normally works but you still have to be careful with how much moisture you put in so that you aren't allowing the air in that environment to go stagnant and stale which then will actually affect the organs of your insect so yes although i messed up i changed that i put them in a much larger enclosure still kept my same routine for misting keeping a humid environment and they have done absolutely fine. The larger enclosure allowed a lot more airflow and it had cross ventilation. So with those mistakes sorted out folks, let's have a look at this scale in more detail. We'll pop on the macro lens and we'll have a talk. Now I haven't actually measured these, but they all, both male and female, come under 10 centimeters in body length. I would say she's probably around about seven or eight at most. So with the macro lens on, we can have a better look at the head. This is about as close as I can get. Excuse the shakiness, I've actually got my elbows on the table and I haven't eaten today, so we're rocking it a little bit. <laughs> now you can see the bright yellow is surrounded in black dots and you can almost miss those eyes. If they didn't have that shine to them and they weren't kind of almost bulging from the head, we could have easily mistaked those eyes for the other black dots. Now the same goes for all the joints, down from the thorax all the way down. You see each joint has those black dots. Uh, body is black with yellow lines going through. Not quite as bright as the joints, but yellow lines all the way. And we follow this right down to the end of her abdomen there. She is gorgeous, she is striking. You have females in an enclosure with these bright yellows and you'll certainly impress your friends at home. Now if we move along a leg again, kind of what you would call a knee joint there, and coming down and down and down. Such a beautiful animal, really, really beautiful. So with the macro lens off then, let's talk about food plants for these guys. Now food plants, I stick to ferns and ferns alone. Now there may be other people that have got these to eat other things, I stick purely to ferns, they love it. Now these guys I have witnessed eating your standard frond type ferns and also your uh, dragon tongue type ferns, the ones that just look like a, a full strip of frond rather than those little wavy bits. I'm trying to think of a best way to explain it to you guys, but you'll know what I mean. I unfortunately don't have any of the, the tongue style in the enclosure at present, otherwise I would have shown you in today's video. So I think what's important now is that we compare her to a male specimen. So I'm gonna go grab the male now and you are gonna be amazed by this. The sexual diamorphism in these, coloration wise, is huge. And boof. There we have, oh, they're both on the run, a mature male. Now I'm trying to get him to settle before I kind of uh, put on the macro lens. I'll kind of keep an eye on her as well. <laughs> I love how they just split apart. It's like, a, it's like a couple that have argued, isn't it? Yes, we've got a film today, darling, but um, we're still not talking over that argument. No, we don't want you disappearing. Right, let me get him in a position and we'll take a closer look. So he's still on the move, but I managed to get a good shot of him there. Look at those colours. He almost looks like, whoa, sorry, with the macro it's hard to keep focus. He almost looks like the colour of those red wrappings you get on sweets over Christmas. You know the ones that when you're a kid you put it over your eyes and it's like, ooh, I can see everything red. Oh, I'm going to have to take this macro off in a minute, but you, you, you get the gist, right? Bright red with blackish legs. He is remarkable and he still has, if I can get the focus right, those black dots in the same places that the female has on the yellow part. He's gorgeous, absolutely mind-blowingly gorgeous. And you can see how the abdomen varies from the female. You will find that most males of most species will have this under tip bulge to the abdomen very very common among nearly all male stick insects in fact but wow 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 so can you imagine guys having these bright reds and bright yellows in your vivarium 
the mixture, the contrast, phenomenal. Now my little lighting setup here didn't quite work. As you can see, it's now just really, really dark and we can't get a good look at them. So we're gonna try and get another angle and then we are gonna talk about the defensive behaviors of these insects because it is pretty interesting. So handleability wise, guys, not bad at all. As nymphs, they are a lot more skittish than they are as adults. I find the mature males like him to be far more skittish than trying to deal with the female down here. She tends to sit still quite a lot of the time, whereas as you can see, he is off on his travels again. I can't help but stare at him though. He's amazing, right? So yeah, there's no real problem with handleability with these. It's just better when they are older. You've got to make sure not to catch their legs between your fingers because they will drop them. And I can just pick up those little red dots on the joints of the legs. Ugh, I love this shot. I wish you would have just stayed still here. <laughs> um, but you do have to bear in mind their defensive behavior. So these guys actually have glands on the thorax just behind the head, tiny little glands that can secrete a milky white fluid. Now most stick insects that secrete or spray is often milky white and this particular one actually contains quinoline. I only know that by reading up a report on their defensive spray. I don't actually know what quinoline is or what it does but I do know that their, their secretion will irritate all the mucous membranes so you need to wash your hands after handling these. I don't know if there is an odour to it so just make sure to wash just in case. If you rub it into your eyes, stick it up your snout or whatever, it is going to burn and you are not going to feel very happy. It's not dangerous to my knowledge but it won't be nice. Now the actual defensive secretion of these insects were in fact studied. Something you do not see that often in the stick insect world, where they have actually put the time and effort into studying how the defensive behavior works. So during this test, they tried with, oh, let me think now, spiders, cockroaches, and oh, what was the other one? Oh, it's just getting difficult with these guys on the move all the time. <laughs> Sorry, I had a brain fart there. The third one was ants. So what they did was they fed the ants, spiders and the cockroaches, all separately of course, um, different things. I think one got a mealworm and some got something else. It doesn't really matter what it was they were feeding on. Um, and then they placed a little bit of this quinoline, a little bit of this defensive fluid um, in there with them. Let's just bring them under the light so you can see better. And they all ceased feeding some immediately, some after a few seconds. I think one of them may have been 60 seconds as well, but they all ceased feeding and left. I need to move positions yet again. Oh, trust me, you guys have no idea how hard it is to just film stick insects for you. <laughs> right, let's try and ignore the male then, and let's come back around where we can see the female. Ah, the lighting on this side is really good. You can see all her colors. So where was I about this experiment? Ah uh, yes, they all ceased feeding, which means that this chemical balance is a deterrent. So it's not something that is killing these insects, but it is deterring them. It has a scent or a compound or the irritant inside it, whatever the reason deters them from that spot. So if a predator was coming like a spider for these guys and they were to secrete that substance, that spider is likely to cease preying on them and run away. So it is a perfect defensive behavior, especially as stick insects do have a lot of predators. I don't know how well this would work on mammals, however. Look at him go, blimey. Steady on, son, look at him. Look, he's trying to breed. He's horny. That's really awkward. <laughs> right, anyway. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm not sure how it'll work on mammals, but on invertebrates, it certainly deters them away, meaning these guys have a better chance of survival. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any over to show you for this. That is over, but these guys live in a substrate bottom to their um, vivarium, 
and the over is so small it'll be too hard for me to find but I will pop up a picture on the screen that somebody else has taken of over on the Phasmid study group page so that you can find your own. Right, I am going to be honest with you guys now, this is actually quite irritating trying to film um, and as I said this is not a species I have mastered, therefore this is about the best of the information that I can currently give you. So you want to feed them ferns, you want them in a humid environment, I like to have a substrate bottom with these guys but if you want to collect up over then certainly don't have a substrate bottom because you'll never find it. As far as I'm aware, they'll eat all different kinds of ferns, so pick what you can get. Now you'll find this easier in summer, they will be big, they will be green, huge fronds everywhere. In winter, you'll probably be picking much smaller ones, and it's always ideal to have some ferns growing in your own garden as well over winter, as it's a little bit more difficult to find them elsewhere. But it's still certainly doable. So I hope this helped guys. Again, these haven't been measured, but will be under 10 centimeters in body length, meaning you don't need anything more than around 30 centimeter tall enclosure, but bigger is better. There we go. Oh, look at that behavior, look. He spotted the gal, he's like, this one's mine, but she's a little bit grumpy today. I think she's got a headache. So <laughs> we're gonna get these guys back in and wrap this video up. Oh. Blimey, <laughs> it is hard work. Honestly, when you're sat there and you're filming them and you're trying to give information, your mind just goes all the time because you're like, don't escape, don't go here, don't do that. It's almost like looking after toddlers while you're trying to give a demonstration. It is hard work. Now, yeah, I could pre-film a load of them and then do a voiceover, but I like doing this. It's fun, it's challenging. Uh, it keeps my brain active for starters. <laughs> um, and also, because when you're doing a voiceover, it's almost very, very scripted, and I'm not the scripted kind of YouTuber. I like to just tell you what I know. Sometimes I have to refer to my notes on my phone or in my pad, but I like to just tell you straight as I'm doing it. That's just my style, that's how I like to be. If you would like me to try a voiceover and have a much more professional video in the future, we can give it a go. Let me know in the comments below. But I personally just like to be me because if I'm not me, why would you watch me? See what I mean? Anyway, yes, so I forgot to mention though guys that they are currently in an exoterra. So that's why they have cross ventilation. Originally, they were in a custom aquaria one like this that just has one ventilation strip and they were doing fine in there until I over missed it before my holiday. So, Mistakes happen, but that's how we learn. And one more thing I'd like to add is I will not be selling the over of this species off because I haven't mastered them yet. I want to make sure that if I do have the next generation that I manage to raise them much more successfully with less mortality rates to know for sure that the information I'm giving you is correct. So that's gonna be it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed watching and I will see you next time. Take care guys, bye-bye. Whew. <sighs>